column. And uh, these, these are popular, so you start to see dinosaurs popping up in a lot of children's magazines. Uh, this was the main form of media uh, after the war. One of the most famous examples of that is uh, Shoji uh, Yamakawa's books of the Kenya Boy series, the uh, Shonen Kenya. Uh, this is set in Kenya uh, around the, the time of the war, and it's about a little uh, boy who's separated from his uh, father and, and living in the jungle, uh, much like Tarzan. But uh, because this was kind of a, a very adventurous thing, the, the jungles of Kenya are full of giant frogs and lizard people and uh, Nazis and, and dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, so this was a very popular uh, series, and there was actually a movie adaptation from Daiei in 1954, so the same year that the original Godzilla came out, that has, you know, uh, the, the boy's companion giant snake in it. I really want to see this movie, but it's never been released in full on one video, unfortunately. Uh, but how this ties into the whole uh, Godzilla franchise is that uh, Yamakawa, the guy that made uh, Kenya Boy, had a student, Waspi Abe, who designed Godzilla. Uh, from there, uh, Kenya Boy continued to exist in Japanese pop culture. It got a TV series in 1961, and this had some more um, crossovers. There was, uh, there was some dinosaurs that showed up in that as well, with the giant snake and other kind of strange things that you would run into in this fantasy version of Africa. Um, and uh, this was lost for a long period of time. If you read my book, you see where I talk about how it's lost. It's now no longer lost because it was found in 2017. So uh, fortunately, it has been recovered. Uh, this was a big uh, hit in, in Japan, and it inspired a number of imitators. Um, one of the uh, examples that's very prominent is uh, Kate Boy Ryu, which was a Shotar Ishimori comic. And got an anime adaptation, you know, again, about this kind of uh, feral child uh, who has adventures battling a number of dinosaurs. Uh, and then, more directly, there was also the Monster Prince yeah. TV series, uh, which uh, Fuminori Akashi, the, the same uh, person that had worked on the, uh, the modeling for the monsters in Kenny Boy, the lead monsters, in uh, Monster Prince. And this is about a kid and his uh, his pet, Nessie, and they battle uh, all sorts of dinosaur creatures. Uh, fun fact, actually, uh, the, the, the manga adaptations for both of those titles were done by the same guy, uh, Shida Ishikawa. So for uh, Ultraman fans out there, I'm sure everybody knows there are a number of dinosaur characters that pop up in Ultraman. Uh, here are just a handful of, of uh, classic examples. Uh, a few of my favorites, just because they are so weird. Uh, you've got the, uh, the, the dinosauroids in Ultraman Giga that are like uh, hyper evolved until they have uh, uh, basically human forms. Uh, you have a, a Skeldon in uh, the Ultraman, who's just literally a skeleton <laughs> uh, going, going on a rampage. Uh, one of my, uh, my other favorites, uh, just because most, most kaiju in, in Ultraman have names. Not this guy, not Choryu Sencha, because Choryu Sencha literally means dinosaur tank. It's right the top. Uh, Ultraman Baby starts off with the, the monster uh, that's a long necked guy there, uh, called the Dinosaur. He doesn't look like a dinosaur, but uh, that's what his name is. And, uh, and Zeton, the monster that kills Ultraman in the uh, last episode of the original series. Spoilers. Yeah, spoilers for a show from 1966. Uh, is, uh, his title is the Space Dinosaur. That's what they say. He's a space dinosaur. I don't see the resemblance, but uh, you know, stuff is different in space. Uh, so Tsukuraya did a lot more dinosaur stuff than this. That. Um, in the 70s, after the Ultraman series had kind of uh, run its course, they started experimenting with other forms of media. And uh, one of the things that they were doing was some mixed animation. Uh, and this guy, uh, Minoru Kucherai, started doing all of these ambitious shorts uh, that were combining different forms of animation. So you would have, you know, 
stop motion um, cell animation on top of it that looked like anime, and it was getting very popular at the time. Uh, so one of the uh, stop motion things that he worked on that was really cool is called the Time Tunnel, where it's basically some people going in and being assaulted by uh, stop motion uh, dinosaurs. It's a lot like the Land of the Lost, which is from the very uh, time taken off in the US at the same time. But uh, this was enough of a successful pitch that uh, they got around to making actually three dinosaur shows in the 1970s, and it's called the, the Dinosaur Trilogy. Each one is done a little bit differently than the others. So the first is uh, Born Free, which is uh, about uh, kind of a team that goes and, and captures the dinosaurs for, uh, for rescue missions. Uh, and that's done with stop motion and animation for the dinosaurs, and the humans are all done in anime style. Uh, Turns out stop motion is really, really difficult to do on a TV timeline. So uh, for their next show, uh, Eisenborg, uh, which is sort of a superhero type of uh, deal, like Ultraman, you have uh, the, the anime people are on top of traditional tokusatsu dinosaur effects. Uh, and uh, this is a, well, we'll get into a little bit more of that in, in a bit. And then the last show in the trilogy is uh, Poseidon, where it doesn't have the anime component anymore, it's just the, uh, the live action and, and the, the dinosaur effects. So uh, it, it feels like it's slowly evolving to become more like Ultraman as the time goes by. So Eisenborg is an interesting one. Uh, it was uh, done as a compilation movie called Attack of the Super Monsters in the US, which has become a bit of a, a notorious uh, thing among anime fans actually have a Brick Tracks uh, edition, so we can watch it that way. But that's only the first four episodes. We don't get to the, uh, the actual superhero stuff in that. Uh, but it's a very popular series in Saudi Arabia, to the point where they actually very recently commissioned new footage for a special uh, Return of Eisenberg movie uh, to be made just for the, uh, for the Arabian market. Uh, more recently, uh, Matt Frank and uh, Hiroshi Kamikani, who are both at the this year, uh, teamed up for a comic book series where uh, Matt Frank is drawing the human people in one style and uh, Hiroshi is drawing the uh, uh, kaiju and, and heroes in a different style, uh, just to imitate that uh, combination of live action and anime footage that you get in the original show. Uh, and then the, uh, the kind of uh, dinosaur character that's uh, front and center there might look familiar to you. He's the, the leader of the bad dinosaurs in the show, but that's actually a, uh, a bit of a recycled costume because it's also in the last dinosaur, which is a Super Aya Rankin Bass co-production from the, uh, the 70s. It went straight to TV in the US and it played a lot and it got a theatrical release in Japan. And uh, this is about a, 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 an expedition to the South Pole where there's a, a secret little patch of territory where there's still dinosaurs and this big game hunter played by Richard Boone goes in and decides that he's gonna go because that's the last place on Earth that he can still be his, his uh, macho self and, and kill animals. So uh, it's, uh, it's actually a delightful movie. It's got a great theme song. Nothing else to watch that theme song. Um, and uh, it's available uh, on DVD right now in the US. I hope for a Blu-ray release at some point, but uh, would, uh, would recommend checking it out. Oh, it's just a great little Lost World ROM. Uh, so Breaking Bass is an interesting one because they're well known in the US, but uh, a lot of their stuff was, well, most of their stuff, frankly, was actually done in Japan. Uh, including all of their animation work. So over the decades, you see different examples of projects done by Rankin Bass that are actually animated in Japan, and people aren't aware of that. But here are a few examples with dinosaurs. Uh, you know, the King Kong show, this was actually the first commission of the material to be made in Japan by a US company. Um, and uh, uh, Willie McBean and his Magic Machine, which is a stop motion thing a lot of people know Rankin Bass for their stop motion Christmas special, so this was a uh, not a Christmas special. Uh, and then also Thundercats briefly had an episode with dinosaurs, which uh, I thought was a fun little piece of trivia. 
In the 1970s, there was this big boom in paranormal uh, popularity, and you can see it everywhere, you know, from Echo Echo Oz, Rock, The Exorcist, all of these paranormal things were becoming very uh, fashionable to, uh, to talk about in the media. And one of those things was the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, so, in Japan, there's kind of a, a famous uh, uh, creature that uh, showed up in uh, Lake Kushiro um, called a uh, Pussy. It's kind of a play on Nessie, uh, which gets a na name dropped in the, the unmade Godzilla movie, Godzilla, God's Angry Messenger. Uh, and uh, there's also the uh, creature that was probably a shark that was captured by a, a Japanese fishing trawler. Uh, the Zuyu uh, Maru, and uh, that got called New Nessie, uh, also in the media a whole lot. Uh, you can see the, the actual corpse there, but that gets a uh, reference in Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Uh, and then lastly, in uh, Lady Kida, there was uh, a, a creature that was called Isi that was getting sighted all the time. So there's all of these lake monsters sightings in, uh, in Japan all of a sudden. Uh, uh, Lake Ikea is also a place where Mothra comes out in GMK, so that's definitely like a deliberate callback of like this creature rising out of the lake was meant to evoke them. Uh, so you can see a lot of Nessie-related stuff in Japanese pop culture in the 1970s. Toho was supposed to make a movie called uh, Nessie, but we did a whole panel about that unmade movie at the, the last GFS, so you can go check that one out if you're more curious about that. Uh, in the unmade movie A Space Godzilla from uh, the Shiba Oyashi, uh, when Godzilla's corpse washes up on the shore, people think that it might be the Loch Ness Monster at first. And then Terror of Mac Godzilla featuring Tomoko Ai, our, our guest this year, there, a lot of people are, are confused by this whole plot line of like, well, why, why are people so uh, wondering about, you know, Dr. Makunia saying, oh, he found this lost dinosaur living in the ocean. Well, that's because there was this whole pop cultural zeitgeist at the time who was obsessed with aquatic dinosaurs that could be lost. That doesn't translate so well today, and a lot of people miss that subtext in the movie. So this all culminates in the uh, 1977 uh, Toei picture, The Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Birds, which, uh, again, some people will be keen to point out, but uh, there's no actual dinosaurs in this movie. It's a, it's a plesiosaur and a, and a pterosaur, but uh, they, uh, they're, they're fighting each other. It's very much a Jaws knockoff, but uh, the idea is that all of these tourists go to this uh, lake in, in the uh, wilderness and get picked off by these, uh, these giant creatures that they have a kind of goofy battle with each other at the end, all things up, to be honest. But it's a very fun movie. It's got an amazing soundtrack. Uh, would recommend uh, Legend of Dinosaurs and Monster Birds. I'll probably get hate for that, but uh, I, I love it. Uh, it's got a, kind of a long lifetime after uh, after its initial release. Um, it had a manga adaptation. It got uh, re released on VHS in the U.S. initially with this great VHS box cover where it says, you know, just for kids, and it has this dinosaur mauling somebody in a very bloody, violent way. Like, obvious. <laughs> Lots of, lots of children, I understand, have been traumatized by this tape over the years. Or perhaps hardened by. What? Or perhaps hardened by. Yes, also possible. <laughs> uh, this one is also featured on Mystery Science Theater, so I think people might be familiar with it from that. Uh, and then I, I gotta uh, point out um, the, the opening sequence in, in this movie, which has to do with, you know, uh, somebody going through Akihabara, the, the forest uh, by Mount Fuji, and falling into this ice cave where there's uh, an egg that hatches and releases this ancient creature. is very similar to a sequence with Yuki Jiro Otara's character in uh, GMK. Also with a you know, suicidal guy wandering into uh, an ice cave in the forest and uh, awakening Hidora. Uh, further on in the 70s, we've got the uh, animated feature uh, Age of the Great Dinosaurs. Uh, this was part of um, Shotaro Ishimori's Fantasy World June series, uh, but it was done as a TV film. It's actually the first anime broadcast in 
stereo. Uh, that's unfortunate because if you find, uh, find the English dub, it's in not very good audio quality. It's very hard to hear what the characters are saying nowadays, but there is an English dub of this out there. So this is basically a story about several children being abducted by aliens and thrown back through the course of time to see the uh, full existence of humankind uh, so that they can learn that life is precious and that we shouldn't pollute the environment or else we'll wind up like the dinosaurs. Uh, I don't know if that's an effective uh, lesson to, for the aliens to be doing, you know, three children at a time, but uh, it works out for the sake of the movie. Uh, what's, uh, what's kind of fun about this movie is, as some people have pointed out, uh, there are some uh, similarities between this and the, the Land Before Time, the uh, 80s American film. Uh, particularly the design of the, of the Tyrannosaur that menaces the, the children. Um, looks very similar to the shark tooth. And uh, they have this uh, sidekick uh, baby dinosaur for most of the film. Uh, it sounds like they're saying baby foot, but they might be saying baby puss. It's a, like I said, the dub is really, really, really hard to hear. Uh, but it, again, it's funny that you know, the main uh, dinosaur in The Land Before Time also has that you know, diminutive uh, name behind it. So, uh, we mentioned uh, Kenya Boy before, and we mentioned Nohiko Kobayashi. Uh, we have to uh, bring up the 1984 Kenya Boy movie, because this movie is insane. Uh, it's uh, pretty much a, an adaptation of the original uh, short story series, but uh, because this is the same director that did House uh, and the Space Godzilla and a lot of other very avant-garde, bizarre movies, this is the only animated movie that he's ever made. You get very surreal sequences where characters will just, you know, switch race for no reason just because it's funny, or they will uh, turn inside out, or they'll. Uh, Colors will infer people will be pixelated. It's very, it's tricky. It's, 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 there's no better, no better word for it. But it has perhaps the greatest unironic uh, climax in which the uh, the main characters are abducted by Nazis. The Nazis set off a nuke. The nuke opens a rift in space time in which dinosaurs come out. The dinosaurs then battle a giant snake that is friends with the main characters. And uh, it's, uh, that's a happy ending. I, I really hope that somebody uh, distributes this movie in, uh, in the West at some point because it is a wild ride, even if it is objectively perhaps not the movie we would call a movie. Uh, there's a short movie from uh, the 80s uh, called uh, The Forest of Heresy. Uh, this is just kind of a, a, a little romp with the uh, Characters, uh, human characters with, with weapons going through this uh, forest that's full of dinosaurs and confronting them. Uh, I just love it because it's this practical effects film that is very under the radar. It's been released on DVD in Japan on a uh, collection with some other short films, but uh, I figured obscurities like that would be things that the G-Test audience would appreciate. One of the biggest uh, dinosaur films that doesn't really get talked about very much because it's animated and part of this other big franchise is uh, the first Doraemon feature. Uh, Doraemon is a huge franchise in Japan. It's about this robot cat from the future that befriends a boy and they go on all these bizarre adventures together. And it has had this ongoing series of movies, uh, dozens of them, uh, along with television shows and manga that's been going since the 50s. But the first movie uh, adaptation is about the, uh, the main character uh, befriending a little plesiosaur and uh, embracing it, and then they go to dinosaur times together <laughs> to, uh, to return it to be with its, uh, with its friends. And this has been a, uh, quite a, quite a, a groundbreaking uh, hit, well-remembered film to the point where it's gotten both sequels and remakes specifically to the, to the Nobita dinosaur section of it. Uh, including, you know, a 2006 remake. Uh, notably for us, uh, this movie, when it debuted in Japan, it, it was on a double bill with a, a reissue of Mothra vs. Godzilla, and 
some Japanese fans have speculated, because it's well publicized, that Steven Spielberg went to go see the movie in the theaters, and then he made E.T., which is a movie about a boy befriending a strange creature that having to return it to be with his family, that he might have taken some inspiration from the two. So, that was my clever segue, because Steven Spielberg also made a movie called Jurassic Park. <laughs> Jurassic Park was a big hit everywhere in the world, uh, as well as Japan. So, uh, it had a, a lot of media tie-ins, including in manga, by uh, Kazumi Sakamoto. I really would like to see this manga get translated, but I'm sure it is a nightmare in terms of uh, licensing for uh, something this old and also with this many companies involved. But it, uh, it really captures a lot of the, the key moments that you would see when you went to see the movie in the theaters. And then there was some other stuff that was made in Japan, just as exclusive to the uh, Jurassic Park series, including a Doraemon crossover at Universal Studios, uh, and some, some rides and theme park attractions and, uh, and a video game. But uh, a rising tide raises all ships, and thus, when Jurassic Park came out, everybody wanted to make a dinosaur movie. So you got all of these uh, movies that came out kind of uh, trying to cash in on the success of Jurassic Park with dinosaurs. The 90s was a great time for dinosaurs. I don't know how to explain this to people who weren't there at the time, but uh, you just go to the VHS store and anything that you want is a, it's got dinosaurs in it. And of course, a lot of these were also released in Japan. Japan didn't stop there, though, because they made a lot of their own stuff to cash in on Jurassic Park as well. Uh, one of the most overt ones is uh, this thing called uh, Powerful Jurassic World. Uh, this was made by Tsuburaya Entertainment, which would not be confused with Tsuburaya Productions. It's the company that the son of Amy Tsuburaya had uh, spun off. And it's basically this hour-long documentary uh, with stop-motion dinosaur footage, and it's actually pretty entertaining. Uh, it's very difficult to check down in its original form. Uh, I suspect that maybe there was some, you know, concern over copyright violation because after uh, a year, they reissued Powerful Jurassic World under a different title. They called it just Dinosaur World on two different VHS teams. They split it into a, uh, a Cretaceous uh, section and a Jurassic section. Uh, again, these tapes are very difficult to, to track down, but uh, there are some clips floating around on the internet, uh, and it, it looks delightful. Uh, this wasn't the only dinosaur documentary. It was the uh, NHK, which is a big public television channel in Japan, also got in on the action, and they made a, a whole Book of Life series, including uh, a whole uh, feature on dinosaurs. Uh, and this is available on DVD as part of a box set for a Book of Life uh, stuff, but it's basically what you would expect from like a, a history or a discovery channel type of do documentary. At the time, it was a big deal because it had a lot of CGI. CGI dinosaurs were not common in 1994, so it was uh, it was kind of groundbreaking and seen as a, a landmark from that perspective. One of my favorite things that was cashing in on Jurassic Park is the kind of follow film Rex, a dinosaur story. Uh, this is about a little girl who finds a baby dinosaur and uh, basically raises it and has to uh, take it to, to be released at the end of the movie, back into the wilderness. Uh, they have a lot of zany adventures together. It's a delightful children's film. Uh, it looks like it was intended to be uh, something for an international release. The credits are all in English. It seems like it was just primed for a dub. It was a huge, huge hit when it played in theaters in Japan. It was Katakawa's biggest selling movie until Lord of the Rings came out. And uh, it kind of wound up getting buried a little bit because the director got caught with cocaine and they pulled it out of theaters. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a shame uh, because it's, it's a really fun, just delightful little movie. It's very cute. Uh, you have the girl uh, teaching her dinosaur, training it like a pet. Um, and then they go on very easy, like uh, antics that the uh, bad guys are chasing them down to try to keep her from releasing it into the bottle. Um, it got a whole lot of media clients. Uh, it had a picture book, it had two different manga adaptations, including one by Clamp, who were not the huge mega hit that he became later in the 90s. Uh, these are the people that did Chobis and Tokyo Babylon and Pollock and Many, many hit titles from the 1990s were uh, these, uh, this group of four women. Uh, and the, the 
because of that, for a long time, it was actually easier to find fan translations of the manga adaptation than of the movie itself. Uh, both of them are now available through fan translations, thankfully. Now, like I said, Rex was a big hit. I think that maybe Toho was taking notes. Because a few months later, they came out with a movie where a baby dinosaur is hatched, befriends a woman, gets studied in a scientific preserve, eats plants, has a, has a kind of psychic connection. Uh, there's a whole lot of connections between Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 and Rex, a dinosaur story. Uh, one of my favorite particular connections is actually the whole uh, combination. There's a whole storyline in Rex where people start trying to exploit the dinosaur and make him appear in television commercials. Toho just went all out and put Baby Godzilla in actual commercials. <laughs> I mean, we got him. So, uh, you would think, okay, so 1993 had a, a cool movie about a child with a, with a pet dinosaur that has to be released and they have a kind of special bond, a psychic connection. Uh, how, how often can that happen? And the answer is, well, apparently more than once, because there's also the animated film, uh, Coup of the Far Seas. This is actually a beautiful film, another one that I would love to see get a, a US release. Uh, the animation is fantastic, and it's basically about a boy uh, who lives on his own with his dad, who's a scientist, and they are in uh, a tropical island, and uh, he finds this strange animal, and he brings it to his dad, and it's like, hey, what's this? And his dad says, oh, it's probably a seal. And then um, he brings it to the, the chief of the natives there. The chief is like, uh, looks like it might be a turtle, but it doesn't have a shell, that's kind of weird. But uh, yeah, sure enough, it turns out this, uh, this creature, Koo, keeps growing larger and larger, and it is in fact a plesiosaur. And of course, eventually, a, a group of uh, dastardly people come to the island with, uh, with weapons to, uh, to try to take Koo away, and they have a big conflict and a big fight with very Home Alone-style props. Uh, it's uh, it's really a, a fun movie. Uh, also, I should note, Koo of the Far Seas is not the same thing as the Summer Days with Koo, which is a movie about a kappa, which is like a little turtle creature. That that one is available in the U.S. So if you go looking for the movie called Koo, the boy and the sea creature, uh, you might be confused. Now, this was not the first attempt to adapt this story. Actually, when it was first attempted, it was in the 80s by Toho. And uh, Koichi Kawakita, the guy that did special effects for the 90s Godzilla movies, uh, was on board to make this movie. And do, doing some of the design work was uh, Shinji Nishikawa, which is actually how he got hired at Toho, was for the Ku movie. And it's funny because, again, Shinji Nishikawa goes on to design Baby Godzilla. Uh, so again, I, I mentioned Nobita's Dinosaur uh, and Jurassic Park exploitation, so it's a great synergy that both of them come together in 1994 when you get a stage show version of Nobita's Dinosaur. So uh, this is recalling that story again for the, for the live action scene. There's also a lot of dinosaurs on television in Japan in the 1990s, because again, dinosaurs are everywhere in the 1990s. The most uh, well-known example is going to be uh, Curious Sentai Zoo Ranger, which is the, the 16th entry of the long-running Super Sentai franchise. And the idea behind this one is that it's uh, dinosaur themed. Uh, some people in the US were watching, and they said, hey, dinosaurs plus superheroes, we should do that. So they licensed the show, replaced all of the Japanese footage uh, with uh, American actors, and re-released it as Mighty Morphin. Power Rangers, and it became a huge, huge hit all around the world. Uh, a few of the other series that came out were all animated, um, and I hope to see some of these get licensed at some point in the near future. Uh, Jura Trigger is one that's a, a lot of fun, uh, as well as the Book of Paradise, which is kind of about a whole village that lives in tandem with the dinosaurs. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, those other programs have not gotten any sort of uh, uh, English language release so far. Uh, some things that have actually gotten the English language release, uh, Dinosaurs from the, from the 2000s is kind of a 
Transformers knockoff with the dinosaurs in it. Um, Dinosaur King, which is part of the whole exploitation movement where they were uh, trying to cash in on the success of Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, where, where kids used dinosaur clubs to battle each other. And uh, Alvarezer, which is another Sentai series that's uh, focused around dinosaurs. So we're in the 2000s now, and uh, that's a good point to talk about Tatsuya Miyanishi's Tyrannosaurus series. This is a bunch of children's books that is uh, written uh, about a a uh, T-Rex named Hart that goes on these kind of heartwarming adventures and you get to, over the course of the um, books, see more of his family and learn. You know, the first uh, is really about him uh, encountering a baby Pilosaurus and deciding, like, no, oh, I'm not actually going to uh, uh, eat this Ankylosaur because it, it thinks that I'm its mother and it will be too mean and then they have a very uh, heartwarming kind of a relationship as uh, the T-Rex is protecting this other baby dinosaur against other dinosaurs that want to eat it. It's very cute. Uh, we recommend bringing it to your children. Uh, and it's a big hit in Japan. So we've got all sorts of adaptations over the years, from stage shows to puppet shows. There's even a crossover with Ultraman. <laughs> oh my God. Yo. Were you say it's kind of like the original Mandalorian? <laughs> I would say the original Mandalorian is global from Cub, so. But uh, it's, a, it's a similar kind of deal with uh, that uh, somebody who's, who's adopted a, a baby and is kind of taking care of it. Uh, and it gets softer over time because uh, he has to take care of the, the baby, but uh, he's still a, a hard guy when it comes to, uh, to fighting the others. So, uh, this, of course, has had a movie adaptation. It's had multiple movie adaptations. The, uh, the 2010 movie, which is the, the first in the series, is Fantastic. It finally has a US release through Discotech. It was just released a couple of months ago. And I would uh, say check that out. It's great if you ever want to see a, uh, a T Rex uh, doing lots of kicks and uh, beating the tar out of uh, other monsters. Uh, and um, unfortunately, the sequels, eh, not, not so good. Um, My Toronto, I haven't actually seen. Um, that's the third one, which was a, a Korean uh, co production. It was actually directed by Koma Chizuno, who you would know from the, uh, the Polygon Godzilla animated trilogy. Uh, so it's, it's more CGI as it, as it goes on. But uh, that first movie is solid, legit. Would recommend you uh, check that one out. So some people will know that uh, the uh, Godzilla was inspired by The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which was an adaptation of a great Brad Warrior story called The Foghorn. Uh, the Foghorn actually got its own adaptation made in Japan in 2007 uh, by a filmmaker named Daisuke Sato. Uh, and it uh, you know, was a, a cool little black and white feature with uh, a dinosaur that's attracted by the sound of a lighthouse's foghorn and, and kind of comes up and, and crashes into it. Uh, this is not available. It's apparently lost. It was apparently on a hard drive that failed and he doesn't have backups for it. Which is a, real shame, but the silver lining of this story is that uh, Sato went on to kind of tweak this concept for a movie called Hell from Beyond the Fog, which is a beautiful, beautiful movie with um, uh, a, a, a sort of dinosaur-like creature that uh, lives in a lake and is, uh, is brought out by, uh, by some of the sounds there. Uh, it's all done with, uh, with puppet effects, uh, so it's it's really cool to uh, see. Uh, it's available from SRS, so uh, if you're going to buy something from SRS, this is one of the things that should be at the top of the list. Uh, another uh, another plesiosaur related movie is uh, Real from uh, Kyoshi Kurosawa. Uh, the plesiosaur in this movie is spoiler is not real. Uh, the whole idea with this movie is that it's about a guy whose wife is in a coma and he kind of hooks up to her mind to go into her dream space. And she has a trauma in her backstory that manifests as a plesiosaur for some reason. It's a mystery that you find out as you watch the film. Uh, but there's a lot of fun sequences of them battling this plesiosaur, which is really a metaphor for something that she doesn't want to deal with. So. Uh, it's, a, it's a neat movie, but again, uh, not exactly technically uh, a dinosaur film. Uh, 
there's an episode of the Next Generation Pat Labor uh, called uh, Crocodile Dungeon. I believe this is one of the ones that, that Kia Takaguchi worked on. Uh, in the original Pat Labor animated series, there's an episode where they go into the sewers and they find some giant crocodiles. And when they did an animated series, they kind of spoofed on this concept a little bit. They kind of subverted people's expectations uh, because uh, they go into the sewers looking for giant crocodiles and instead they find a dinosaur. Uh, but uh, it's kind of a, a, an anti-climax in a fun way because while they're, they're you know, running around trying to avoid this dinosaur, when it finally makes it to the surface, Pat Labor is a giant robot series, which is about uh, you know, cops with giant robots that fight bad guys with giant robots. And then the dinosaur gets out into their hangar and they have a giant robot that completely dwarfs the size of the dinosaur over there. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, again, Pat Labor is fantastic. I keep telling Kaiju fans to, uh, to check it out. They've got some great uh, Kaiju spoof episodes. Uh, in 2018, there was another NHK documentary series on, uh, on dinosaurs. It's called the Dinosaur Super World. Um, people in the paleontology community seem to, to rant and rave about this, uh, about this show. I haven't watched very much of it myself, but uh, uh, if you are one of those dinosaur people, you should probably put it on your list to uh, check it out. And uh, another movie I haven't had the chance to actually see myself yet is uh, Yamasada no uh, Uda, which is uh, about a, a village that, uh, that finds a baby dinosaur and, uh, and kind of raises it and it becomes a, a PR stunt for the, uh, for the people that live there. Um, haven't found a whole lot outside of a, a trailer for this film, but uh, it looks neat. Uh, there have been a couple of short films that have been in the, the limelight recently. Uh, oops. Um, I, changed, uh, I changed the slides around, so um, this has Paleon on this twice. The, the animated one isn't Paleon on, it's called uh, Jurassic. Uh, Jurassic is a, is a short film that's just kind of about dinosaurs running amok in, in a modern day city. Uh, and it's very short, you can uh, watch it in, in just a couple minutes, and it's, uh, it's a delight. Um, Paleonaut is a, uh, a short film uh, from the director who uh, has a movie coming out very soon called TK Boys. Uh, and the concept there is it's about uh, a guy who's being sent back in time like an astronaut. So it's all kind of him dealing with his uh, uh, emotional state and, and the, the preparation of what am I going to do as a settler whose whole thing is to go back in time and, and explore in ancient times and I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to come back to the present again. Uh, dinosaur stuff is very minimal in that, but again, it's a, it's a cool uh, psychological kind of uh, study. It's a character piece. Uh, a couple of things that are uh, fun that you can check out on streaming services. Uh, Dino Girl Gapo is on Netflix. That's about a girl who turns into a dinosaur. And Gallon Dino is about a, uh, a woman who has a dinosaur as a roommate. And it looks really stupid. It's, it's a lot of, uh, it looks kind of goofy. Uh, of course, there have been a few, uh, a few lost films over the time. The, the original Bride of Godzilla from the 50s concept uh, was a uh, something where they find a whole cave underground with lots of dinosaurs in it that kind of led to the creation of Rodan later. Uh, Godzilla, God's Angry Messenger uh, is a sort of Chariots of the Gods story that never got made in the 80s where aliens would have picked up Godzilla in ancient times as a dinosaur and mutated it into his current form and then released him. It's, it's a, if you ever read that script, it is a, it is a head trick. It's, a, it's, it's wacky. Uh, and there was also the, uh, the American unmade Ultraman movie, uh, Hero from the Stars, which actually is a whole lot like, uh, like Eisenborg, the whole idea that you have dinosaurs that live under the ground and decide, humanity's had its time, but I'm gonna come up and, and take over. Uh, it's, it's a similar idea to the, the animated series that Get a Robo also, so. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's not it. There's all sorts of other dinosaur-related uh, content in Japan. <laughs> Uh, I think we've got like five minutes so I can keep going with Korea or we can take questions. What do you guys think?
Yo. I just want to uh, bring this up. That amazing uh, Dino World documentary, that is all on HBO Max. Oh, excellent. Yo. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the release plans are. It might be available in Japan, but uh, NHK is weird. They don't always put things out on um, on home video, even though they really should. Yeah. Minor correction about Return of Eisenhower. It, what? Minor correction about Return of Eisenhower. Yes. It, it, it's primarily a documentary, but the last uh, 10 minutes or so are a, a new episode. Kind of like how, like how the, the documentary will frame versus Common Rider. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, they, they commissioned uh, the Gucci again to, uh, to direct the uh, footage. Yo. Yeah, I'm glad Common Rider was mentioned because another one that uh, was a dinosaur uh, series that we thought we could have been mentioned was Common Rider on the device because of the way they have a T-Rex movie. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that one is on right now, so yeah, it was maybe. Tell me more about T-Rex. Sure. Hey. There hasn't. I think that there should. Uh, the only Dinotopia adaptation that I know of is the. Uh, yeah, kind of not so great one. Yep. Actually, we are going to get a new Dinotopia series. It's just recently just been confirmed. What? Yeah, it's being produced by the uh, one of the producers of Clifford the Big Red Dog. What? That is a uh, wild. <laughs> yeah, and we're also getting a new Dino. Uh, we're also getting a brand new uh, Dinosaur documentary series by the guys who are working with Dinosaur for NBC as well. I heard about that one. Good to know, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, 